All right, so in this experiment, right, we're going to be studying, of course, um, chemical reactions. And so the first thing I'm going to do is to take a few minutes and just talk about, of course, right, a given um, equation. And so when we're in the laboratory, please note each and every reaction is represented by means of an equation. And so what do I mean by that? Well, of course, it will involve, of course, what? Right in the reactant or the reactant, of course, right, on, of course, the left. Followed by that arrow, right, that says what well, it yields, it produces, or it affords your product, of course, on the right. Now, you could have one product, or it could be more than one product. And so please note, when you go, of course, to write these so-called balanced chemical equations, a few things. It's going to be extremely important, right, that you know the state of each of your, of course, uh, materials. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have a solid, then please note that chemical formula should be followed, by, of course, by what? By an S. If, of course, it's a pure liquid, then an L. In this experiment, of course, we're also going to be producing, of course, a gas. So, therefore, it should be followed by the symbol G. And, of course, in the laboratory, oftentimes, right, our products are aqueous solutions. That just means, of course, that that substance is dissolved, right, in water. So, knowing the state of your reactants and your products is, are going to be extremely important. That's one thing. Likewise, of course, as you try to balance these equations, my goal, hopefully, is that you must be able to determine the type of reactions. And so, please take a few minutes try to make sure that you review that section. So, what are the types of reactions you, we've discussed so far, of course, in lecture? So we've talked about, of course, what are a single displacement reaction, we've also discussed, of course, our double displacement reaction, and one reaction, of course, it to be our combination reactions, so our combination reactions, of course, or all the times or of course as our synthesis right reactions and finally of course our decomposition reactions so as we go through of course at each of course of the reactions today it's going to be extremely important that you identify right the type of reactions that's involved but what's going to even be more important on this thing today's map right is that you're going to, you should be able to give me what we what i call these well balanced chemical equations. And so, I'm just going to do an example, not an example, of course, that is going to be, of course, be, of course, uh, performed in this experiment. So, for example, if I take nitrogen gas, notice, of course, I'm writing here, it's a gas. If it combines with hydrogen gas, do you guys agree that this process, I write, and you're probably familiar with this reaction now, of course, in class, this reaction yields ammonia, right, also referred to as a gas. Please note, I've included, right, the states of each of my what starting material. So as written, you need, you need to realize, of course, that this reaction is not complete. Why not? So as I noted, of course, in the lecture, right, atoms are neither created or destroyed. In a given chemical reaction, what is happening, of course, is that we just have the rearrangements, of course, of these atoms. And so the number of N atoms, of course, on my reactant side must be equal to that on the product side. And so how do we solve that problem? Well, we do so right by adding what are called what coefficients. These are just integers that are placed in front of right, these chemical formulas. And so when I look at this equation, you should note, right now, of course, we have what? There's two N atoms of my, on my reactant side, just one on the product side. So what do I do? Well, we use, of course, these coefficients to make sure, right, that the amount is equal on both sides. Now, in so doing, you should note, this is not a sum, this is a product. In so doing, I now I have also changed, right, the number of H atoms. What do I now have? Well, it's not going to be six on my product side. So how do I make sure that it's equal? Well, I also need to add a coefficient of three in front, of course, my reactant H2. So not only do I need for you, of course, to Right, of course, a balanced equation, you must include the states of each of your reactants and products. And then at the end, I need for you to determine also the type of reaction. So what do we have here? 
Well, in this case, please note, we have, of course, what? Two, right? Two of our starting materials, two reactants, going to produce a single product. And therefore, this reaction, of course, is referred to as a combination, right? Or a synthesis reaction. Now, a lot of our, and through this experiment, I guarantee you that you will have to identify a single displacement, a double displacement, and even a decomposition reaction. To predict, of course, the states, I need for you to take a few minutes and go back to our wonderful solubility rules, right, that we discussed in class. So here, of course, are the solubility rules that's actually going to apply, that you'll need to apply to today's experiment. And so the first one states what? I assure you that you're going to be working, of course, with, of course, solutions that contain the sodium ion. So I need for you to recall that all lithium, any, of course, um, compound that contains what? Not just the lithium ion, but lithium, sodium, right, potassium, the ammonium ion, right? These are all, of course, going to be soluble in water. And so when I say soluble in water, what does that mean? That implies, of course, that if you produce, for example, sodium sulfate, then you should identify that, right, as an aqueous solution. Why? Because all sodium salts are soluble. In addition to that, of course, in today's lab, we're going to be working with nitrates. So I need for you to also keep in mind that not just all nitrates, but also, of course, all acetates. Do you guys agree with that? So all acetates. Likewise, all perchlorates, right, or solvent in water. And when we say solvent in water, it just means, of course, right, that they're going to exist as your aqueous solutions. And then finally, so there's three rules that's going to apply in today's experiment. Don't forget that most of our halides, so most of our halides are soluble. When I say halide, what does that mean? Well, that's just, of course, our halogens from group seven, right? So in group seven, we have what? Fluorine, chlorine, Br, and I. When they exist, of course, as those anions, they're referred to, of course, as your halide ions, right? So most halides are soluble. Sodium chloride is a, of course, right? It's so-called, right, halides. So most are soluble. So here it becomes, of course, right, the exceptions. So except which one? So except what? So except, of course, the halides that contain which ions? Well, except the halides, please note, that contains lead, right, silver, or that mercuric ion. So, yes, great. So most of our halides are soluble, but if that those halides contain, and so check in today's lab, right, if your halide contains, of course, what, lead, silver, mercury, then of course it's going to be insoluble in water. And when I say that, what does that mean? That just means, of course, you're going to get, of course, a precipitate, a solid. And then finally, when you go to balance these equations, do not forget a few rules, right? There are some elements that exist as what? A diatomic molecule. So please note, when we talk about, of course, oxygen, it is not O, right? Oxygen exists as that diatomic molecule O2. Hydrogen, which might also be produced in today's lab, exists, of course, as H2. And then finally, just to give you a great hint, if you take copper, solid, and when, of course, you heat that, and we did this earlier, right, in, er in a previous experiment, don't forget that my product, of course, is actually a black solid, copper 2 oxide. So I'll have you guys figure out exactly what that chemical formula is, and then go back, of course, right, and balance that equation. Right. So in, in our first experiment, right, we're starting off with magnesium. And so if you um, just take a look, of course, at the solid, this is a shiny metal. And so magnesium is going to um, react, of course, right, with a 0.1, and that's M, the sense of molarity, with a 0.1 molar solution of hydrochloric acid. Now, you, you're actually having a hard, might have a hard time observing the solution, but HCl is just a clear color solution. And so you might be able to observe that, right, um, better in this case. So here's my hydrochloric acid solution. And so what I'm going to be doing, of course, right, I'm going to be transferring, of course, HCl to my test tube that contains, um, please note, um, the magnesium metal. 
So this has already been pre-measured. And so let's see exactly um, what we observe. So I'm just gonna stir this around for a minute and I should probably just use my um, test tube holder. And so hopefully you sh you're you able to observe, of course, well, the evolution of a gas. So you, you, might see, you might see some bubbling. The solution that I'm forming, and I will give you the chemical formula, that solution is also just clear and colorless. Right, so that magnesium metal is reacting with my acidic solution. Um, a gas, of course, um, is being produced. And I'm also generating a clear, right, colorless solution. I let it sit for a while. Hopefully, um, you can observe um, a bit more of that gas. Now, you might notice, of course, that I use a, a bit of an excess amount, of course, of magnesium. So not all the magnesium will react, right? Um, however, please do not include that in the product side of the equation. It's not a product. It was a reactant. So you should be able to observe, of course, um, the bubbles, right, representing, of course, the evolution of the gas H2. Um, so in our next um, experiment, right, um, studying chemical reactions, we're going to be looking at the reaction, of course, between, of course, potassium iodide, um, a clear colorless solution, along, of course, with the reaction with, of course, lead to nitrate, which is also, of course, a clear colorless solution. So what I have here, of course, are two test tubes, right, containing both solutions. And so in the next step, I'm actually just going to go ahead, of course, and transfer, of course, my potassium iodide solution to my solution that is containing, of course, um, lead to nitrate. And so let's see if there is any re reaction. So hopefully you should be able, of course, right, to see that color change after adding, of course, my potassium iodide. But not only, right, should, should you see a color change, hopefully you should also be able to observe, of course, right, the formation, of course, of an insoluble, of course, um, compound. So a solid is actually formed. The challenge will be for you to balance that chemical equation and using our solubility rule, right, predict of the two products, which of course is the solid, right, and which of those, uh, one of the two, which of course is soluble in water. So you're going to be writing a balanced chemical equation between, of course, potassium iodide, right, and lead to nitrate. So in this part of the experiment, we're starting off, of course, with copper 2-sulfate pentahydrate. So it's a hydrate, and we've actually performed this experiment um, in a previous um, reaction. And um, don't forget, of course, that when hydrates, of course, are heated, what happens? Well, water is going to, of course, evaporate. So you'll notice, of course, if you see the formation, of course, right, of H2O, hopefully condensing, of course, on this, um, the walls of our, our test tube. And of course, also note any color change. But before I begin the heating process, please keep in mind that it is extremely important that you hold, of course, that test tube at a 45 degree angle to that flame. But also, even more importantly, it, of course, the opening must be away, right, from, of course, any student or observer. And, and in heating, what we do, of course, in the laboratory at a 45 degree angle. Of course, I just move, of course, what? Uh, my test tube at a 45 degree angle, of course, it in and out of that flame. So you should notice, of course, um, a color change. And then hopefully as well, right? Um, some condensation occurring, of course, um, on the inner walls of this container. So, of course, now my blue solid, right, has now been converted, of course, to a white, of course, solid. So, therefore, the hydrate 
has now formed of course what my anhydrous salt And hopefully you can now see, of course, um, the condensation right on the inner walls of my test tube. So in this part of the experiment, um, we're, we're starting off, of course, with copper metal. Again, a shiny um, um, reddish brown solid, right? And the goal, of course, is to allow copper to react with atmospheric oxygen. Don't forget, of course, that the chemical form for that is O2. And in the process, of course, right, we'll see exactly um, the color of the compound that is formed. So it's going to be allowed to heat, again, using, of course, our crucible, our clay triangle. Is going to allow, I'm going to allow this to heat for a few minutes. And so and I will then, of course, show you exactly, right, the color of the product that is, of course, produced. So now that the heated process is complete, I'm going to remove, of course, my crucible from um, the flame. And so you should be able to observe, right, the formation of that black solid, which represents, of course, copper to oxide. So in our um, next experiment, we're going to be looking at the reaction between, of course, um, steel wool. So th this represents, of course, our sample, of course, of iron. And that is going to be reacting, right, with, of course, what? With a light blue solution of copper. And by now you should be able to guess that it's a copper complex. A copper, of course, um, to, of course, sulfate solution. So here's my test tube containing, of course, um, steel wool representing, of course, iron. And again, I'm going to slowly add, right, my copper to solution to our solid. And so what do we know about copper solutions? They are blue in color. Hopefully, of course, when we form another aqueous solution, once the copper is consumed, once my copper two sulfate solution is consumed, you should, of course, observe a color change, right? So that light blue color should change and you should be able to observe that change. So now of course what well, notice of course that my solution is now of course a clear colorless solution. But in addition to that, right, if you take a look of course at um, my original iron, notice of course and now it's what well, it's now what reddish brown in color. Again you should note which solid of course is reddish brown in color. That is certainly of course what a deposit, of course, right, of copper metal. So copper metal, again, is adhering, of course, to my iron, and my copper two sulfate, right, has been converted, right, to a solution um, containing, of course, right, Fe plus two ions. In this experiment, we're gonna be looking at the reaction between iron three chloride. Notice, of course, it's a, um, a light yellow solution, right? And it's going to react, of course, um, with a 0.1 molar solution of sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide, of course, is a clear, right, colorless solution. So I'm going to um, add, slowly add. So I'm going to grab, of course, uh, my test tube, my test tube holder. And I'm going to slowly add the sodium hydroxide to my solution, right, containing iron 3 chloride. So hopefully, of course, you can, of course, um, see that color change. But not only, of course, right, is that color going from light yellow to, of course, um, almost, of course, a light brown, of course, um, solid. That's right. So, of course, again, I'm forming a precipitate, right? A solid, of course, suspended, of course, in this solution. And it's kind of reddish brown in color.
In this final reaction, we're starting off, of course, with ammonium carbonate. And so um, I need for you to recognize, of course, that on heating, this actually produces, of course, right, several gases. One in particular, right, will be, of course, ammonia. And so ammonia, chemical formula NH3, is actually, of course, what, a weak, right, base. And so um, I can actually, of course, confirm, right, the presence, of course, of that gas or the evolution of that gas by literally mounting, of course, um, a damped litmus paper. But this litmus paper has to be red in color. And so in the presence, please note, in the presence, of course, of a base, red, that red litmus paper will change color, right, to blue. Now, remember I said to you earlier that this reaction is going to involve what? The formation of what? Of three gases. And so, as a hint, I'm giving you one. One possible gas is ammonia. And so, again, heating, of course, my solid. And I will do this by wafting back and forth in that flame. And I'll wait for this reaction to occur for a few minutes. And so that solid, you should see, of course, that the amount of that solid is decreasing. You should also note, of course, the color change of our litmus paper. It was initially red and slowly, right, our litmus paper is turning, of course, blue. Due, of course, to the formation of that gas, of course, right, which is, of course, a base. Likewise, of course, you're going to notice, of course, some condensation, right, on the walls of our container. So you should be able to predict, right, what's the possible gas that's condensing on the walls of that container. And if I keep on heating, right, do you agree, of course, because all of my products are gases, guess what? My solid will be completely, right, decomposed.